Masada on Red Sea, the last bastion of the Jewish nation, which fell to the Romans in the year 7. For 2,000... The eternal light prints The Remnant, the story of the renewal of European Jewry, part one. Before the destruction of the temple in the year 70 of the Common Era, a sizable Jewish community was established in Rome, the first European power with which the Jews came in contact. Rabbi Ariel Toaf of Rome comments. We know that about two centuries before the Common Era, Judah Maccabee met the leaders of the Jewish community in Rome. So we think that uh, the Jewish community of Rome is the oldest of all the Jewish communities of the diaspora. Under the Roman Republic, the Jews flourished. Their kingdom, Judea, became a Roman province. Jews enjoyed positions of great prominence under the Republic, which imposed no restraints on religious or national differences. Many Jews were Roman citizens, yet they preserved their own traditions. In Ostia, the port of Rome, the ruins of an ancient synagogue attest to the affluence of the Jews who built it and to their freedom to worship as they pleased. The synagogue, the oldest Jewish archaeological remain in Europe, was large enough to hold a congregation of 500 worshippers. Still recognizable is the oven for baking matzah. And the sanctuary facing Jerusalem with the symbols of the menorah, lulab, etrog, and shofar. The Jews supported Julius Caesar in his struggle for power against Pompey and received his favor as their reward. But with his death, their fate passed into other hands. Rome became an empire. The Arch of Titus in Rome commemorates his victory over the Jewish nation, which rebelled against imperial tyranny in the year 68 of the Common Era. Within two years, the temple was destroyed and a dispersion began. By the third century, Jews had settled throughout the most distant provinces of the Roman Empire. By the time the empire collapsed, they were identified with European civilization, which, for better or worse, was to mold their destiny and the destiny of the world. As the Jews spread through Europe, they settled on the left bank of the Vlatava River at Prague, one of the major market towns along the great trade highway that led from the Middle East to the Rhineland. Pavel Kohlmann, president of Prague's Jewish community, recalls the origins of his people in the Czech lands. The existence of Jews in this city was first recorded more than a thousand years ago, in the year 965. The record was made by a Jewish Arab diplomat, Abraham Ibn Yaakov, who came to this city as an envoy of the Caliph of Cordoba. This synagogue was built 700 years ago in the last 60s of the 13th century in Gothic style. It is one of the last real Gothic synagogues which exists and it is the most venerable place of Jewish worship uh, as throughout these seven centuries never services ceased to take place in this synagogue.
Prague's greatest rabbi was Judah Lowy, whose chair is preserved in the Alt Neu synagogue. He was the spiritual leader of the ghetto at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries. The outstanding Jewish scholar of his time, Lowy was respected by Christians and revered by the Jewish masses, yearning for redemption. They ascribed to him the creation of the legendary Golem, a clay robot believed hidden in the synagogue's attic who had one day written to protect the threatened community. The Prague ghetto became virtually an autonomous town, with its own flag awarded to the Jews for their part in the Czech's war against the Swedes, its own judges, police, and fire department. Its town hall is still used by the Jewish community today. In the old Jewish cemetery of Prague, Jewish dead were buried in tombs piled on top of each other, crowded together in the graveyard as they had been forced to live in the ghetto. Rabbi Loi lies in his sarcophagus, surrounded by 35 of his disciples. Maizel Synagogue testifies to the rich spiritual and cultural life of the Jews in Bohemia and Moravia. In one of the world's greatest collections of ritual objects, it displays the silver treasures of these old Jewish communities. Throughout Europe, a pattern emerged. The establishment of a tenuous Jewish community, the initial support of the local ruler, then inevitably persecution, annihilation, or flight. Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia, a haven for Spanish Jews, who almost two centuries before the formal expulsion from the Iberian Peninsula, foresaw the persecutions to come. A descendant of this unbroken line is Emilio Tolentino, the president and de facto rabbi of the Jewish community. This synagogue is the first synagogue in Yugoslavia, and the all in the Balkan, and the third in Europe. From beginning in the year 1352, the 140 year for the Spanish Inquisition. The first Jews coming here in Dubrovnik in year 1306 from Spain. With the first family when come here in Dubrovnik is only my family when comes from Toledo. Again, that is my name for my family, Tolentino Toledano. The Dubrovnik Synagogue, with its Baroque Ark and Torah scrolls which date from the 13th century, was enriched by the migration of Jews from Spain, where Jewish poets, philosophers, scientists, scholars, doctors, statesmen and financiers flourished under seven centuries of Muslim rule. As Catholic monarchs took over Spain, many Jews were forcibly converted to Christianity, but continued to practice Judaism secretly. In 1478, the Inquisition set out to destroy these Moranos, or secret Jews. Nearly 30,000 were tortured to death or burned alive at the stake. In 1492, 
Ferdinand and Isabella expelled all the Jews from Spain. 150,000 refugees, the heirs of a culture that had produced the poet Judah Halevi and scholars Solomon Ibn Gabirol and Maimonides, were robbed of almost all their possessions and given four months to leave the country. It was the most traumatic event in the history of the diaspora until the 20th century. The Jewish community in France, which dates back to Roman times, reached its peak in the 11th and 12th centuries when it produced such great scholars as Gershom, called the Light of the Exile, and Rashi, whose commentaries made him world famous. Rabbinical schools in Provence rivaled those of Spain in prominence, but by the time of the expulsion from Spain, the Catholic kings of France had turned against the Jews. Some of the Spanish refugees found a haven, however, at Avignon, where under the personal protection of the popes, they were able to form one of four holy communities, part of the pontifical states. While Europe was being transformed by the Renaissance, the Jews prayed for redemption. The symbol of their hope in the synagogue at Cavaillon in southern France is the chair of Elijah, reserved for the prophet, who will herald the coming of the Messiah. The deterioration of Jewish life under the popes is recalled by Rabbi Toaf. You may know that in 1555, Pope Paul IV decided to build in Rome a ghetto. So the Jewish uh, people of our community were clothed in a small uh, place here uh, near the synagogue and they lived there for many centuries and uh, that position of the Jewish people uh, was very difficult because in every place of Italy there was a renaissance but uh, in uh, Rome for the Jews was a middle age, a dark age each year, leaders of the Rome ghetto paid homage to the Pope by presenting him with a Torah which he would return with a contemptuous remark. Jews lived confined behind the ghetto walls. The gates were locked at night. Heavy penalties were assessed against those who left the ghetto without wearing a distinctive yellow or red hat. Money was extorted from the Jews for the upkeep of a house of converts where kidnapped Jewish children were baptized. The indignities were endless. Yet the Jews endured. Michelangelo sought inspiration from Jewish faces for his portrayal of biblical figures. Vasari, in his Lives of the Artists, wrote how the Jews of Rome streamed out of the ghetto on Saturday afternoons to watch Michelangelo work on his Moses. Jew transfigured by his encounter with God, a God whom the Christians worshipped while reviling the people through whom he was revealed. It is the paradox at the heart of Western civilization which has never been resolved. Venice in the Renaissance was an oligarchical city-state which had dominated Mediterranean commerce since the 10th century. Jews participated early in the city's banking and maritime trade. Jewish merchants were taxed exorbitantly by the city government, and Jews were forced to live separate from the Christian community. But because the policy of the city's rulers was relatively lenient, 
the Jewish community of Venice was enlarged by successive waves of refugees from other lands. The spiritual leader of modern Venice's small Jewish community is 34-year-old Rabbi Abraham Piatelli, a descendant of the Anavim, one of the distinguished Jewish families Titus is said to have brought to Rome after the destruction of the temple. He is rabbi of the Spanish synagogue, built in 1550, late in the history of Venetian Jewry. Today, it is 1,000 years that Jews live in Venice. After they lived in Venice for more than 500 years, the Jews were enclosed in the area around the synagogues that you see today. The place was named Ghetto. And the ghetto, the word ghetto, is Venetian one. Because in this area was a foundry for the canons. And ghetto in Italian language means to throw this ghetto, to throw the iron, the material to make canons. And the ghetto of Venice is the first ghetto in the world. It was founded on the, in the 1516. The ghetto began when large numbers of German Jewish refugees poured into the city. They were segregated into the area around the new foundry, the Ghetto Novo. Later in 1541, Jewish traders from the Middle East were settled near the adjacent old foundry, the Ghetto Vecchio, where they were joined by Moranos, who were permitted to live in Venice after 1589. To the ordinary Jew in the ghetto, Venice was the city of books. Here the Bible was printed in Hebrew, and for the first time, the complete Talmud, enabling the masses of European Jewry to own and study their own copies of the sacred texts. Despite restrictions imposed on them, Venetian Jews also developed their own banks, which had originated in pawn shops, to lend money at no interest to the poor. The banks prospered. Jewish financiers with their international connections contributed greatly to the city's wealth. Jews participated actively in the renaissance of Italian culture surrounding them. Jewish merchants and artisans migrated to Great Britain in the wake of the Norman conquest in 1066. William the Conqueror and his immediate heirs protected the Jews. Later, however, Jews were robbed, pillaged, massacred, and finally expelled in 1290 by Edward I. There were said to be 16,000 Jews in England at the time. The coronation throne in Westminster Abbey, on which every British monarch since the 14th century has been crowned. Beneath it, the stone of Scone, reputedly Jacob's pillow at Bethel. Like the church, the state claimed legitimacy from an association with the people it had rejected. Beavis Marks, site of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London. This synagogue was the first to be built in England after the readmission of the Jews by Oliver Cromwell in 1656. Cromwell's decision was influenced by the writings and personal appeals of Manasseh ben Israel, the chief rabbi of Amsterdam. The philo-Semitism of the Puritans, absorbed with the Bible and the people of the book, and the appreciation of what Jewish merchants could do for British trade, made England a haven for persecuted Jews in the centuries to follow. The 
Beginning in 1880, a great new wave of Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe reached England. Their descendants in Petticoat Lane in the East End of London. For 125 years, the history of the Jewish community in England has been recorded by the influential weekly newspaper, The Jewish Chronicle. Its editor, William Frankel, talks about Great Britain's contemporary Jewish community. Today there are about 400,000 to a half a million Jews in this community. There is no accurate figure. But we can say that most of them have been born in England, and it's a very well integrated community. For example, in the House of Commons, where there are some 600 members, over 40 of them are Jews, which is about six times the national average. And in all aspects of national life, the Jews in this country take a very prominent and active part. And yet, fully integrated though we are, the community has preserved a strong Jewish identity. One year after their return to England, in 1657, Jews were admitted to Denmark, the first Jewish settlement in Scandinavia. The Danes granted the Jews full religious freedom in 1814 and complete civil and political equality in 1849. The great synagogue of Copenhagen, built in 1833. Rabbi Bent Melchior, son of the chief rabbi of Denmark, the Jewish community in Denmark, now more than 350 years old, has changed in its general outlook and changed in its frame. Those Jews who wished the Jewishness of their families to continue moved little by little towards Copenhagen and we have in Copenhagen, the central community today of all Denmark and only very, very few Jews uh, living in the Danish provinces. We are today made up, I would say, of two major parts, uh, namely the part that is today the greater part, uh, descendants of those Jews who came to Denmark in the beginning of this century and those Jews who are descendants of so-called old Danish Jews, or as they also are named, the Viking Jews. Uh, to some extent, I belong uh, to them myself. Uh, seven and eight and nine generations back, uh, in my family, there were rabbis of this community. In Paris, Baron Edmund de Rothschild recalls his grandfather's reaction to the emergence of modern anti-Semitism in Tsarist Russia, an anti-Semitism officially promulgated as a policy of the state. My recollections are very small because my grandfather died when I was only uh, eight years old. He was himself very old. He was 91 in 1934. But I still do remember how the whole story came up. And my family had interest in Baku and uh, pet, uh, in the petrols of Baku, and my grandfather went in 1884 to Russia. He then saw and heard of, but not visualized, uh, the pogroms, the attitude of the Tsars towards the Jews, and the attitude of general population to do, towards the Jews. He also saw the enormous 
desire of wanting to go back to Palestine. The famous story that every one of us knows each year, next year in Jerusalem, was really a living desire in Russia. He then decided two things. He convinced his cousins and nephews to sell the interest we had in Russia at the time in order not to have anything to do with these people anymore and to negotiate with the uh, Ottoman Empire the buying of land in Palestine to establish the Jewish people. The Jews decided to redeem themselves. The yearning of the masses to return to the land of their fathers found political expression in the writings of a Viennese journalist, Theodor Herzl, who founded the Zionist movement. According to the Balfour Declaration of 1917, Great Britain promised to view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. April 1st, 1933, Joseph Goebbels, propaganda minister of the Third Reich, announces the anti-Jewish laws. Jewish businesses closed. Jews stripped of their civil rights, their German citizenship. The first steps toward the premeditated mass murder of the Jewish people, who had survived among the alien nations of Europe for so long. On May 10, 1933, Goebbels calls for the burning of all books considered subversive. An ominous portent of things to come. The fires of the Holocaust were lit. Yeah.